The day has finally arrived, and that day was Friday. The Mega Man Battle Network Legacy Collections, which is quite a mouthful, finally dropped and Best Buy was pretty prompt at getting me my copy. I can now finally play these games without needing to bust out my GBA or scrambling to get them all on Wii U before the eShop closed. Whoops. This series was a huge part of my adolescence, me playing 8 out of the 10 titles on these compilations and the two I missed being different versions of the games that I did play, so yeah, I was pretty into them. I've been looking forward to doing videos on this series for a bit now, but the Legacy Collection has only one chance to make a first impression, and it'll probably be a hot topic for a few weeks. So today, I'll just be discussing the basics of the series for those unfamiliar, what the presentation is like for this repackaging, as well as any changes that stand out, along with my brief thoughts on each game included, as well as some of my plans going forward. I'm Wes, The Explosion, and this is Mega Man Battle Network Legacy Collection. Ugh, I had to say the whole thing again. So to get everyone up to speed, Mega Man is a little robot boy that jumps and shoots and takes down other robots to get their powers and save the world. Battle Network is an alternate reality where he's a computer program instead, called a NetNavi that runs around the internet, running errands and deleting computer viruses. Essentially a sentient, combat-ready internet browser. Rather than platforming, you move about a 6x3 board, each side getting 9 squares, and battling until one faction loses all their HP. You still have your buster, but it's pretty piddly until you upgrade it, so your main form of offense are battle chips. You keep a folder of up to 30 and each round, your net up, the human who works with the net navi in the physical world, sends you a selection to choose from to help you out. You get new chips either by soundly defeating enemies or buying them in shops, and a lot goes into what you stick in your folder. How many you can use at once, and what combinations work well together, but that's its whole own topic. Oh, and because Dragon Ball was still decently popular when these came out, in a lot of these titles, Mega Man can also transform, giving him completely different fighting abilities with things like heat gut style, to straight up fusion techniques like the Double Soul. As someone who really liked the Boo Saga, I appreciate things like this. So we've gone from a classic platformer to a grid based, deck building action RPG, which is a bit of a jump. Personally, I'm simple enough that when I see the name Mega Man, I'm happy putting me perfectly in the center of this Venn diagram, but I imagine there's a good chunk of people that like either one or the other. And then there's also Mega Man Legends out there somewhere, deciding on whether it wants to join the rest of the franchise or be its own little niche. But anyway, since this is just a divergent timeline, a lot of the same characters end up showing up, from the obvious from the title Mega Man, to series standards like Proto Man and Roll, to the Robot Masters like Guts Man, Metal Man, and Spark Man, and there's even a small number of Reploids sprinkled in. Each one's look has been updated for the new format, ranging from recognizable to a complete departure, to a few dead ringers. And the majority of these RMs managed to make it in, as long as they were introduced before Mega Man 9. The swap to this new world seems to stem largely from the usual suspects, Light and Wily. Light is now known as Tadashi Hikari, who seems to have focused largely on computer technologies and had a more traditional family, you playing as his grandson Lan in the games. Albert, on the other hand, is still known as Wily, just Mr. this time, and he still likes robots. His irritation at them being sidelined leading him to some pretty destructive ends. So yeah, Light being Japanese instead of American and Wily never getting his doctorate leads to an internet-focused world instead of a robot-centered one. Oh, and the whole traditionally building a family instead of making one in a lab thing. Despite these being ports of older games, there are day one patches for each. Kind of curious as to what those are about. And one of the first things you see when you boot up one of the collections is a warning about photosensitivity. Pretty standard. And another warning. That some cultural depictions in-game might not be cool anymore, but they kept everything the same to preserve authenticity. So if they commit a racism, it's fine. Then you're greeted by Mega Man EXE, who will talk to you and guide you through the menus. That's right, we can finally get rid of our copies of Sonic Forces because we no longer need Sonic to be our best friend, we have Mega Man now. I thought the voice sounded familiar so I looked it up and Andrew Francis, the voice actor from the anime, comes back for the role which is awesome. Then you can choose your game, swapping versions if you desire, and the menu even keeps track of which ones you've started if you haven't forgot or just it's been a while. There's a setting tab you can choose from, but these can be accessed in the game, so we'll talk about them a bit later. The gallery has the standard stuff, 
from an artwork gallery, mystery data, which seems to be the same but for some spin-off and extra promotional stuff not associated with a specific game, and a music player. Download Chips lets you load in extra chips that you'd need promotional codes and the like to get previously into your save files. And then there's a tab for trophies, which as you'll note, I already have several of, due to my high level of skill. A few of them are blocked off, but that's nothing a quick Google search can't fix. I look forward to clearing all of them, though I hope I can't softlock myself out of any of them and need to restart a save. Most of this stuff is pretty standard for these collections, though the previously exclusive chips are nice, plus I really love the fully voiced Mega Man you have for the main menu. Sure, it's goofy, but it's fun and is the sort of thing that means a lot to longtime fans, so I really appreciate the inclusion. For the in-game settings, you have a few options, from how big the game screen is, to what borders you use. These are nice, but as a small gripe, I do wish you saw your changes as you made them, rather than having to exit the menu, then go right back in if they're not to your liking. You can also customize sound settings, and there's a filter option for the visuals. Turned on by default, it kind of smooths out the pixels, and while I appreciate options, it's not one I'll be using much. The filter gives a lot of the characters an almost waxy look that I am not fond of, whereas while the original sprites might look a bit rough around the edges, they do have charm. While it might be nostalgia, I'd be fine with completely redone modern graphics for these games, so I don't think that's it. I just kind of find this setting ugly, though it could just be me. In a similar vein, the text also seems to be redone. While message boards assure me that the original dialogue is intact, and indeed, I have seen some typos that back this up, the games use a more modern font that, while not quite Times New Roman, does look pretty generic and out of place. Wish we could get the pixels back for these too, because it looks really weird in these old games, but eh, it could be worse. One last thing is this collection's difficulty option, Buster Max Mode, which makes all your regular shots do 100 damage. Given that you start out only doing one damage with the buster, this is a huge power upgrade and lets you rip through even bosses. Not the sort of thing I'll be using, but if you're new to the series and need an edge, more power to ya. Even if I'm not likely to touch this menu too terribly often, options are nice, and while this doesn't offer anything amazing, I do like that these things are here. Oh, and there's an online mode, but it seems to be for each individual title, and I'm not far enough in any of them to avoid getting immediately stomped, so I haven't touched them. Maybe in a few weeks or months we can talk about them beyond just acknowledging their existences. But as for the games themselves, this is another set of collections that feel unbalanced. There are 10 games, but 4 of them are just alternate versions of an entry, doing the Pokemon thing, so if you wanted to look at them as 6 instead, I would not argue with you. Collection 1 is 1 through 3. It's been a significant amount of time since I played most of these, but since they did make such a big impression on me, I can run you through my general thoughts on them. 1 is fine. It's the first title, so it's the simplest one here, and you have to temper your expectations a bit, but it's still fun. When you play the other games though, it definitely does feel like a prototype. 2 is a bit more robust. The story's a little less simple, they add in style changes so you can swap out how you play, they don't limit the boss roster quite as much as the first, which is largely based off of Mega Man 1, and there's just, in general, more to do in this one, making it an early favorite of mine. Then you get to 3, which is the hardest one for me to talk about. It comes in two versions, blue and white, me having the latter while my brother had the former. And while many cite this one as a favorite, it was the first I played, so my memories of it are kinda hazy. Different versions have different chips and a few unique bosses and style changes. One thing I do remember pretty strongly is that I got the impression that the first three games have a difficulty curve. I recall having a kind of tough time with this one due to my inexperience, but when I got the previous two titles, through EB Games and eBay, I completely demolished both. It was like I'd taken my weighted training clothing off. So while the first collection is a bit of a slow start, I would call it a pretty solid lineup and definitely worth the buy if you're into the genre. Start with one since not only will it give you context for the story, it'll also help you build the skills you need, but if it starts feeling a bit too simple, you could look up a plot summary and skip to two. Then, much like X, the second collection is less appealing than the first. It starts off with Battle Network 4, Red Sun and Blue Moon. I had one of these, though it's 
not worth recalling or digging out my copy to determine which one. I think it was Moon, though. The different games have different characters and navvies which you fuse with to get their double soul, this game's gimmick and fusion technique. Unlike 3, which I don't fully remember due to how much I stuffed into my brain afterwards, 4 I forgot about almost completely as soon as I was done playing it. This one is largely considered the worst in the series and what kind of killed it, it probably being in the top 3 worst Mega Man titles. The sad thing is, it's the only one designed to be played multiple times, yet it's the only one that's not worth playing even once. You beat the game, you restart with a new game plus, doing a harder difficulty with stronger enemies and new navvies to meet and fight. To get everything, you have to play through the game three times I believe, which would normally be a dream for me, but I immediately shelved it upon completion. I think the big thing was that since they made six different versions of the game, three routes in each, everything just kind of felt incomplete and vapid, Plus, I don't think some of its mechanics were implemented the best. I'm kind of curious as to how my replays will go. Moving on to 5, this is another one most people don't like, Teams Proto Man and Colonel. A lot of people cite this as what cemented the Battle Network series' downward decline and why a lot of people did not pick up the final entry. While the story is largely the same, the cast of characters you interact with and get to play as, that's right, you're not just limited to Mega Man this time, are completely different between versions. I never got the original cartridges, but instead the dual collection on DS, Double Team, so I was able to play both, and while this is probably not a very common opinion, I think whether this entry is fun or not largely has to do with which version you play. While I'd rank 3, Blue and White the same, and put 4, Red Sun and Blue Moon together as well, Team Proto Man and Team Colonel would end up with quite the gap in between. One has a squad that's a blast to play with, whereas the other requires a lot of setup or the enemy wandering into your attack range to be effective. As for which is which, all I'll say is that X4 is always an excellent choice. Then we get to the final entry, Battle Network 6, Cybees Gregar and Cybees Falser. And yes, I did say final. While they could do either sequel titles with a new cast or interludes with the current, this is one of the few Mega Man series to wrap everything up and have a satisfying finale. Like the last game, different versions have different allies you can play and fuse with, but there's also a giant creature that you can fight and gain the abilities of. Like the title suggests, Faltzer, a giant bird, and Gregor, a large wolf. While both are really good, Gregor is my favorite, just due to the roster, and the only title in the series I 100%ed. Well, almost. I needed one more chip to get the last program advanced combination, and the only way to get it was from a very rare data spawn. Or one specific, guaranteed drop in the Japanese-only Boktai crossover area. After trying for over an hour, maybe two, and not getting the chip, I gave up, and kinda held this omission against the game ever since. But I hear the versions in this collection will finally include this extra dungeon, so I have hope. If I heard wrong or it was misreported though, I will be very mad Capcom. To get back to the main point though, you have the first collection, which is pretty darn good, especially at the price point, and then the second, which has one game that sucks, one game that I only like half the time, and maybe the best one in the series. While it's not quite as unbalanced as the X collection, it does feel a little similar. I would still recommend Collection 2 here, largely for 6 and partially for Colonel, that's right you forced it out of me, I'd say Collection 1 is the much safer bet. Currently I'm playing through Battle Network 1 on stream and despite the advice I gave earlier, I'm working on 3 on my own. I want to play them in my free time as well, so I figured I could do one version privately and it'd feel fresh again when I got around to them publicly. That's also why I've only been using these two for footage, in case you've noticed. I've already mentioned that I want to get all of the achievements, but I'd also like to 100% all the titles, though some may drive me crazy to do so. Guess we'll see. I'll also probably start doing a lot more content for the series, from the obvious reviews and game rankings like I've done for X and Classic, to stuff like comparing the Robot Master and NetNavi versions of characters and stating which one I like more. Also might do more plot and lore videos, since RPGs give me a bit more to work with, and I wouldn't mind taking a look at anime and manga stuff too, but I'd need to learn some copyright rules, so I'm not the most confident on them. Point is, we're just getting started with these games. 
While Battle Network is still Mega Man though, it is a completely different genre, so hopefully I'm not shooting myself in the foot with this. Please let me know your own level of enthusiasm, or lack of, in the comments, and while I won't not make Battle Network videos, I might at least pace them a bit more if people aren't too keen on it. For right now though, thanks for watching, maybe consider subscribing if you like Mega Man content, and perhaps I'll see you in the next one. For everlasting peace.